Hi, everybody. John Spoiner, welcome to this week's edition of Wine Uncensored. So this week we have um, a whole bunch of great people to talk to tonight. Um, with um, partnership with Corvin, we have Greg Lambrecht, the um, founder and inventor of Corvin. Um, then we also are going to be um, visiting the world of fortified wines. And so we have three of the big houses in each of the main uh, types of fortifieds. We have uh, Lucas Marata with um, uh, House of Lustau, the Sherry House. Um, we have Paul Meunier um, with Blandy's, um, the Madeira House, and Adrian Bridge of uh, Tedder Fladgate uh, Port House. So we're going to be um, doing a, a kind of an overview of all three. We're not going to do a deep dive into each one. There'll be um, shows coming out later this year that we'll do a deep dive into each of the different ones later on. Um, but we're going to get a good overview and we're going to see um, kind of the differences. And we're also going to look at some of the um, tourism events that are available in each of the different regions. So um, let's go ahead and get things started um, uh, with Greg. Go ahead, Greg, take it over here. Awesome, well, thank you. Thank you, John, and, and thank you to uh, Paul, Adrian, and Lucas uh, for walking us through their incredible wines, which I fell in love with, uh, partly as a result of work in Corvin, but I've had the tremendous pleasure of at least visiting Oporto. I, I, I still, post-pandemic, need to visit everybody else. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick background on, on where Corvin came from uh, and then speak to you a little bit about the old one or the, 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 the long-term Corvin as well as the new pivot system just very quickly uh, and then turn us over to these great experts. Uh, I'm a medical device entrepreneur. Um, I actually invent new medical therapies, not really uh, from the wine industry, but I absolutely love wine. Uh, I ran into a problem though, and that is that I had to drink the entire bottle if I wanted to have a glass of it, because as soon as you open it, it started to oxidize. And uh, my wife didn't like the same wines that I liked. And when friends came over, I had to serve them what was open, not what I was, what they wanted necessarily. And I realized what I wanted to do was something like tonight, taste across five, six, seven different wines on a Tuesday, or whatever today is Thursday, uh, and then be able to put them back in my wine fridge or rack and, or cellar and not have to think about when I'm gonna drink from them again. So I remember writing this down, I was, invent things after writing down a need statement. What is the problem I'm trying to solve? Because I find that new innovations frequently come from that, right? an innovative perspective on the problem rather than a new technology. So I remember writing a way to drink any wine from any bottle I own, any day of the week, any quantity I want without having to think about when I'm gonna drink from it again. And this is actually from a dinner I had with Lucas Paya in Spain, or Lucas, he's gonna be speaking later. Uh, and I, as soon as I invented it, I was drinking across multiple bottles in, in an evening without having to drink a full glass of each, I can have as much as I wanted or as little as I wanted and then come back to them and taste them whenever. So if you click forward, um, I wanted to show you what the invention is, the original core of it, if you're looking at my screen, it's got a needle that goes through a cork, it's got a clamp that fits on the bottle and it's got a little trigger that in, inserts um, an inert gas, argon. It's a, it's a gas used by winemakers. Uh, during the bottling process to keep air away. The inert gases don't have any smell or taste and they don't react with anything. So I happen to have a bottle of 1997 Taylor Flaggate Vintage Port that Adrian and I drank on an Instagram Live at some point last year. Uh, and I'll show you how it works. You simply take it, place it on top of the bottle, press the needle through, hit the bottle sideways, press the trigger, gas goes in, let go, and this wonderful wine comes out. And if you want more wine, you just press the trigger again. Every time I'm doing that, argon goes into the bottle, essentially inflating the bottle, pushing the wine out so that no air gets in during pouring. And then I take the needle out, cork is elastic. A lot of it comes from Portugal. You can see the trees there. Uh, and uh, the cork reseals. You can drink this again, whatever. I happen to know this is a great wine. Um, so that was the idea behind Coravin. Uh, and if you click forward, uh, we're always innovating, but what I was pleasantly surprised about, because I invented this for my own use at home, uh, to drink across the wines that I had, check if they were ready, bring them over to friends' houses, make sure they were good, um, is the reception of Corvin by everybody else in the wine industry. We're used by wineries. Uh, you see Burgundians in the top image, that's Piemonte in the bottom, uh, Chateau de Tour in the middle and the lower, Germany up above. So we're used by wineries around the world to serve wines to their guests, restaurants, any wine by the glass, educators um, to, to teach their students, wine critics. There's Bob Parker and there's, um, I know that James Suckling, I think does more than 14,000 bottles by Corvin every year to taste them. And then wine lovers in their home. So that's a, 
it's been incredibly gratifying. We're now in over 60 countries uh, worldwide since launch in 2013. Did we click forward? Mm. Man, that's good. Um, Tennessee, delicious wine. All right, so uh, it's going to take me a second. Um, to pivot, I was flying home from Australia and I'd just been at a dinner with um, a Australian wine collector and he goes, I don't need my wine to last for years after I access it. Um, I only really need a month or two. Uh, and if you didn't have to last for years, could you work with every closure? Because right now Corbin works with cork and screw cap, but it doesn't work with T-tops. It doesn't work with some of those uh, uh, Venalox, the glass corks and all these other things. And could you make it pour faster? Could you make it less expensive? And so on the airplane back from Australia, where I invent most things, uh, trapped in a, in a coach seat, uh, I came up with the idea of pivot, and it's a, a way of pouring wine from an open bottle, but still preserving it. And it uses the basic idea of Corbin. It uses the same inert gas of argon, the same capsule, to push the wine out of the bottle and into your glass so that air doesn't get in the pouring process. But it uses its own sort of cork. Uh, it's a replacement stopper, um, a pivot stopper. I'll use this marvelous uh, Blandies. Uh, you simply remove the cork or the screw cap or the T-top or the Venalock or whatever it is, place our stopper into the bottle without pouring. It's very important not to let extra air in. And then we've got this very simple pivot. Instead of a needle, it uses a big tube uh, that's much less expensive to make. Uh, you pass it through the valve at the top, you tip the bottle sideways, and you press this little button, and wine pours out into your glass very quickly. Now you can fill a glass in a couple of seconds. So uh, it uses less gas because the tube is big, it pours faster, and it's less expensive for us to make. And so it winds up being much more affordable. Uh, the wines don't last for years, but they last uh, for up to a month. And these fortified wines will last a whole lot longer. Um, and actually with these fortified wines, what I am probably going to do tonight is pop the stopper off and place the original stopper right back in. Uh, I just unsold a bunch of extra stoppers, but it works quite well with fortified wines. Uh, I wouldn't do it with um, with normal still wines, but these guys are are much tougher. So that's the idea of pivot. It uh, goes out to a month, and I'm going to try to get it to go longer than that. Uh, just place it right back in your cellar or wherever you want, and and uh, you can sample it in the quantity that you want whenever you want, and it should be just as good as the first taste. So if you click forward, this is the idea of Corbin. Um, we want the wine to be indistinguishable. When we say that it lasts for a month. We mean that you should be able to blind taste that wine against a full bottle of the same wine uh, that was never uh, Corvin or pivoted, and it should taste identical, not just something you'd be willing to serve or you aren't going to throw away or you'd consider to use for cooking. We mean identical. Uh, and the same is true for smart clamps. Smart clamps, the, the needle-based Corvins, those guys are timeless. They'll go out years. My oldest is 14-year blind tasting uh, from a bottle I had Corvin 14 years ago uh, and a fresh bottle from the same case. So. It should be indefinite. And uh, lots of videos online about how to take care of your Corbins. Uh, but it should, I hope, change the way that you drink wine, make tastings like this uh, easy to do. You can drink across three, four, five, six bottles of fortified wines, put them back into your fridge cellar uh, rack, and drink them at your own pace. So this is the new uh, Corbin pivot. Um, it comes with a couple of stoppers and capsule gas. Uh, and it's uh, much more affordable and approachable. It's very easy to use, as you saw. Uh, and I'll turn it over to John because the winner uh, will be notified by email about who gets one. Right, so everybody pay attention tonight because there's gonna be a little quiz at the end of the, of the episode. Um, we're gonna ask questions about each of the different um, presentations and the one who has the um, most correct answers um, will win a um, pivot um, courtesy of Corvin and um, you will be notified via email, the email that you registered with. So um, whichever one, just be sure and watch that. Cause I know sometimes people register with an email that's not their primary email. Um, if there is a tie, um, we will randomly pick somebody. Well, I won't, but I'll get um, one of the gentlemen here to um, randomly pick one of the names that came out um, and we'll send that out to you. So watch for that. Um, also watch um, in the email tomorrow, there'll be a, um, a discount code that'll be sent out again, courtesy of Corbin. So if you want to go ahead and um, pick up one of the new um, pivots or even one of the classics, um, I believe that discount code will work um, across the board there. So sure. uh, watch for that tomorrow. So 
Well, thank you guys. Now I get to enjoy listening and, and tasting through these wines with you all. Well, good. On that note, then, um, let's um, turn it over to Lucas. Um, we're at the house of Lustau um, down in Hedis. So, um, Lucas, I'm going to go and turn it over to you. So. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, we have uh, three different fortified wine regions today. Uh, we thought Jerez should be first because uh, the wines that we're trying today are uh, dry, one of them really dry. Uh, so it made sense that we're uh, starting off uh, the tasting with um, this region. Um, so what are the slides that we have, uh, John? There you go. All right, La, yeah, let's talk about uh, Jerez um, a little bit um, and start with history. Uh, I know that all three regions share long way making histories, but in Jerez, we can trace that back to the Phoenicians era, uh, many, many centuries ago. And um, besides having a, a, a long, you know, proof archeological evidence here, uh, as far as wine making, um, the thing with Jerez is that it's really multicultural. Um, the background is, um, um, you know, just a lot of different societies uh, taking over the region over the course of uh, centuries. Some of, sometimes uh, residing there for for a long time, bringing in their their knowledge, um, their their own cultures, their language, the the way they they did things. And it's all this melting pot over the course of, of centuries that uh, creates the, the region. Uh, if you look at the name uh, from the original Shera, that was this uh, Phoenician settlement, uh, keeps evolving into Seret uh, during the Roman era, then Sherish during the Arab era, then Sheres, Jerez, uh, Sheri. Uh, many, many influences here by all these people, right? So this multicultural aspect is something that's quite unique to, to the region compared to, to, the, other, to the other two. Uh, but um, yeah, um, these are historic 45 wine regions for sure. Um, as far as the, the shape of the land and the location, Jerez is... Um, the southernmost uh, wine growing region as far as continental Europe. Obviously, we have Madeira, which is a little bit farther latitude. But uh, this is very close to, to Africa um, in the, the, the southernmost tip of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, of course, uh, their own climate, uh, more Mediterranean, uh, with mild, short, mild winters and and a long and, and dry and, and hot growing season, but with a lot of, a lot of influence from the uh, big body of water all around the, the area and, and the land masses like Africa, you know, the Africa continent and the rest of the Iberian Peninsula. So a lot of influence uh, from, from the winds. You have these two famous winds, one from the Atlantic, one from the more the interior or the, even the Sahara Desert. Um, pretty much opposite winds. One is humid and cool. The other one is hot and dry. So the region experiences this uh, fluctuation of, of both uh, levels of humidity and, and temperature uh, that, could, that could happen on a daily basis, uh, obviously seasonally or weekly, but even, even daily, you could have like a a cool and humid morning and, and, and a rather hot uh, afternoon. So um, a region that is really aware of what's going on as far as uh, climate conditions to make sure that the wines stay uh, in, in, in the proper uh, environments. Um, the, when we talk about the architecture, we'll, we'll touch on, on this aspect, which is very important. Also in, in the other two regions, uh, uh, I guess, but uh, in Jerez, uh, the architecture plays a, a key role for sure. And then something also pretty unique to, to the region in this case is the three um, very well-defined aging locations. Uh, you, you have uh, no, no one, mm, like could be the case in the other two regions, but, but three very distinguished 
and very well defined as far as uh, origin, um, where you can age the wines uh, for as long as, uh, as you want. Uh, and all of them will, will become, ultimately become sherry. And you have Sanducar de Barrameda by the, the mouth of the river in that uh, north um, uh, western uh, corner. Uh, this receives a lot of that oceanic influence. Um, then you have El Puerto Santa Maria, farther south, also by the, the water, by the ocean, but a little, a little more sheltered from those um, westerly, western winds. Um, we receive more of the Levante sometimes, more of the hot influence from, from the interior. Uh, in a natural, like different, different terroir, uh, in summary, um, different conditions. And then finally you have Jerez City, which is the capital of the region where most of the big winers are found. Um, and it's inland, as you can see, and a different, a little more continental climate with, with greater um, shift of, of uh, temperature and definitely a little bit cooler in the winter and hotter in the summer. So uh, when you age the wines in one of the three, the result could be quite, quite different because of the, um, you know, the different conditions in, in the three towns. So, uh, something to take into consideration when, when comparing Jerez to other uh, 45 wine, wine regions. Um, if we move on, uh, we can talk about the soils, something that uh, also distinguishes Jerez from, in this case, Port and, and Madeira. Here we have uh, mostly Albariza soils. Uh, also, some vineyards are in, in more like clay-based soils, which are these barrows. Um, down under, you know, like down in the bottom, on the bottom of the slopes in, in deeper soils and also to arenas, which are the, the more sandy coastal parts. Um, and those, those two also have some, some vineyard sites, but most of the, the grapes come from vines that are planted in albarizas and albarizas are usually at the, at the top of the hills of these uh, outcrops of, of limestone. Uh, very chalky, uh, extremely white, um, very uh, special type of soil that um, re definitely influences the the the, the, res the, the, the taste of the wine. Um, Abarifas, besides that, uh, are very important and because of their composition um, and the the texture, um, the amount of uh, lime that you can find limestone in, in, in the soil, along with the texture allows for the soil to uh, capture a lot of the, the winter rain uh, as a, like, a, like a sponge. Uh, and then the, as, as we were saying at the beginning, the, the summers are, the, the growing seasons are very, uh, very dry for the most part. So uh, these thirsty vines uh, are supplied with, with the necessary most during the, the summer um, by the albariza uh, that stores these, this water that falls mostly in, in the fall and, and winter months. So uh, it's, it's very important that um, vines for quality grapes are planted in, in this soil. Um, also the, the composition of the soil will definitely impact the, 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 the profile of the wines. And uh, these are very chalky, um, with very low nutrients as well, uh, high quality um, grapes that uh, are used for uh, the top the top cherries. So yeah, uh, very unique soils compared to other regions. And then obviously we have uh, our own grapes here. Um, three grape varieties, all white, mm, something that uh, could also differ from, from the other two. Uh, all cherries are made from white grapes. Um, and again, you have uh, one that um, stands out of the rest, which is um, Palomino. Uh, um, all the dry Jerez's are from Palomino, uh, covering more than 95% of the, the vineyard surface. Um, so these two wines today, are both 100% uh, Palomino. Um, and then 
Moscatel and Pedro Jimenez, um, minor representation, just around 2%, uh, to produce uh, single varietal sweet wines. So usually these two grape varieties, uh, Muscat from uh, Muscat of Alexandria, or, or, or the bigger berry Muscat, typical from southern uh, Mediterranean shores, um, is uh, producing beautiful Muscat dessert, dessert wines. And same with Pedro Jimenez, um, another white variety that is used to produce this very, very dark, very uh, concentrated, uh, raisin-like, uh, unique um, sweet wines um, that bear the name of the grape. Uh, both it of goes them. very well over ice cream for an and Pedro Jimenez. Yes, so vanilla ice cream is a is a classic with Pedro Jimenez. So. Um, yeah, Palomino for, for the dry wines and both Moscatel and Pedro Jimenez to produce not only single varietal wines, but also to sweeten, potentially sweeten some dry wines of Palomino with uh, small uh, portions of, um, especially Pedro Jimenez or, or Moscatel uh, sweet wines. So um, then the blending is a, is a big part, like in, in, in Pura Madeira to be part of the, of the winemaking process here. So those are the grapes. And then I think we can start with uh, wine number one, which is this uh, Fino Jarana, as I, as I was saying, 100% Palomino. Um, but then if we talk about Jerez, we always need to mention this uh, diversity. You know? uh, we have wines that cover the, the whole spectrum, right? We can, we can have uh, very dry wines, uh, that are protected uh, from any oxidation uh, and affected by, by the floor yeast, which is also something very particular from the region. Or you can have these other sweet Pedro Chimene wines that are, are some of the sweetest wines in, in the world and, and everything in between. Uh, we, we have, when we taste the sherry, sometimes we have like 10 or 15 different glasses in front of us and they're all different styles. And the one on the far uh, left is the driest wine I'm gonna try that day. And the one on the far right is probably the sweetest wine I'm gonna try uh, on, on that same day. And, and then in between we'll have another 10 or 12 styles. So diversity, a huge choice, endless opportunities uh, is what the region offers here. We chose uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, most famous wines from Jerez because of their, its unique uh, winemaking process. And this is a Fino. A Fino is a sherry wine that um, undergoes what's known as the sherry method, which also um, distinguishes or sets sherry apart from the other two regions. Here, the fortification, this addition of alcohol is gonna occur, is gonna take place only once the fermentation process is complete. So with, with Finos and most of dry Jerez's, we let the grape juice fully ferment, all the sugars get fermented out. And then it's only once we have a, a dry base wines that, that we are alcohol to it. So these Finos are lovely 12% ABV, dry fruity, uh, dry wines, white wines that receive about 3% uh, of alcohol. So we bring the wine up to 15% and between 15 and 16. And this amount of alcohol is the ideal for the local floor yeast to thrive, to grow to appear on the surface of the wines. So these are the, those famous wines that are sitting in those barrels in the solar systems and all of the barrels have that layer, that film of floor yeast on, on top of the wines. And this floor, uh, like in Champagne, is gonna ultimately shape and change and, 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 and you know, transform the taste of, of the wine over, over time. Um, at the same time, we'll be protecting 
the wine from any oxidation. Eh? The floor needs oxygen to, to, to live. So the environment inside is, you know, ambient inside the barrel is completely oxygen free. So you can have a wine in a cask for, this is five years or more. Some of these phenols are eight or even 10 or more years and keep the wine pale and oxidized, even reductive because of this floor activity, protecting the wine from, from any oxygen. So these are what we um, call biological wines because of the effect, effect of, the, of the floor yeast, this, this live uh, microorganism uh, on, on the wine. So these wines on the floor are also known as biological wines. And wine number one, uh, this pheno, uh, again, stayed, uh, remain in the cask in the system uh, for up to five years uh, with inside barrels that contain that that had that that layer of, of floor sitting sitting on the surface. So very special. Uh, nothing to to come across when you visit uh, Porto or Madeira. Um, and the driest wine uh, by far uh, here uh, out of this lineup. Um, now, Lucas, the, the floor is, is naturally occurring, right? You're not inoculating anything into the barrel to get it to grow. It just, it finds its the, way there, right? So. This is the, um, the evolution, the natural evolution of this floor uh, that existed here uh, for centuries. And in fact, if you have any, any wine uh, sitting in any corner of any winery in the region, if you uh, leave that wine there in that tank or that barrel, uh, no matter what, after a few days, you're going to see floor showing up uh, on top of the wine. So uh, there's not much you can do besides bumping up the alcohol to kill off the floor. If you keep it at 15% ish or, or lower, you're going to have floor wines. Uh, so that's how much intense the, the, this animal is. Uh, it's all over the place. Yeah. So the, the way to produce wine number two, and we'll get to that when, when we taste it, is uh, increasing the alcohol levels so you prevent the floor from, from growing. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, this beautiful, uh, you know, uh, film. Uh, the floor, floor is because it, it, it looks like almost flower petals. Eh? It's... Uh, we're not, you know, uh, growing growing flowers here, but we definitely have like a garden of, of yeast on, on top of, of the wine. So that's maybe because of um, the, the name, eh? Flor. Uh, but definitely something that is um, not only happening in Jerez, but we could say that uh, if there is a region that mastered the, the floor, uh, usage for winemaking, that's definitely Jerez, and that's wine number one. Um, another common thread maybe with the other two regions is the, the influence of the architecture, right? Uh, arguably both Madeira and Port uh, are going to say the same thing. Um, in Jerez, uh, this is um, so much so that we, we even have a, a concept, a perception that there is a, a terroir inside the bodega. Um, so we have the terroir coming outside of the vineyard. Obviously, uh, depending on where these wines, these grapes are, are coming from, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna be able to, to produce uh, several styles. But what happens within the bodega buildings, within these walls, is uh, so impactful that um, definitely there is some some part of terroir uh, coming coming out of this um, design, this architecture, these these spaces, right? And as you can see, this is very cathedral-like style. Um, these are not new buildings. These were built uh, 200, 150 years ago. And they're still in, in good uh, working condition because they've proven to be the, the perfect rooms for, for aging, aging these wines. Uh, they, they, they were designed um, on purpose to create 
these uh, ideal conditions for for the wines to thrive um, with with airflow, uh, with control over the temperature, with a more stable temperature uh, throughout the seasons, with um, a specific orientation that will will like suck in uh, the winds that come from hopefully more the oceanic side and bring in more humidity and and cool temperatures. So. Um, the, the the environment that you can create inside the buildings will uh, ultimately help um, the wines to to in the case of the floor wines to maintain their their yeast uh, more efficiently and in the case of any other oxidative non-floor wine to prevent any further evaporation which nobody nobody wants um, uh, too much so yeah the the, the buildings are, are, are important. Huh? We talk about the, the, the winds, the, the gray varieties, the soils, but in Jerez, the architecture is also a key factor for sure. And then, yeah, uh, some other regions use Solera systems, but um, again, I think um, nobody's gonna argue that, argue that um, Jerez or Jerez uh, producers have um, very well um, managed and handled and mastered the Solera, Sistema de Solera y Criaderas uh, aging method um, with this uh, group of barrels that are stuck in a particular way and all of them containing wine at a different stage of development. So uh, this, these are for the most part multi-vintage or non-vintage wines. And this is why you don't have vintage dates on, on the front labels of, of most sherries, because you keep, you constantly blend. Uh, this is a, a fractional blending system where you uh, move wine through the barrels, through the different levels, through the different groups of barrels. Um, maybe maybe twice maybe three times um, four times a year you take some wine out of the system which is usually the finished wine the wine that is ready to be consumed bottled uh, released usually from the solera uh, group of barrels which is typically at the ground level uh, that will have um, the the wine to to um, put out on the market and as soon as you take some wine out, and these are small portions usually uh, from each and, and every one of those barrels, as soon as you take the wine out, you're gonna be replenishing that same uh, amount of wine with uh, wine from the next level up, which is gonna be containing younger wine. Uh, and that same operation again, from uh, replenishing from the uh, farther up uh, level, um, and so forth until you reach the end of the system. And some of the systems could be only three, uh, three stories, three level uh, systems, like the one here in the picture. Some of them could be like 10 different criaderas or escalas, no? 10 different groups of barrels. The idea is that you always do it in one single direction and that uh, all the wines get blended over and over again. And that's why here in Jerez, we assess the age of the wine with uh, an approximate calculation of average age. Um, this is more an equation involving how much wine you have at the beginning of any given year, how, how much wine you take out of the system and how often you do that. So thus how much wine you have at the end of the uh, same year that will give you the rotation of the stocks, uh, the rotation of the inventory and the average age of the wines. Uh, this first wine is five years old uh, because of that is the where the wine averages out as far as um, all the wines in, in the system. But in theory, you could have wine that is decades old, some small portion decades or maybe even a century old in, in some of them, right? So. Some of these Solera systems were started uh, more than a century ago, uh, sometimes 150 or more years ago. So that means that possibly some, some drops in some of these barrels are uh, 150 year old. old. Um, so, so yeah, um, 
it's difficult. Uh, the, the, the older the wine, the more difficult it is to exactly assess the, the potential average age of that wine, but definitely the region you can find um, very old wines, uh, 50, 80, 100 year old wines uh, that have been in these soleras that were studied uh, a long time ago. Uh, so very special. And then wine number two, also a very dry wine compared to the rest of the wines here today. Uh, another wine that is produced um, using the, the sherry method. So we, we let the grape juice uh, fully ferment uh, before we throw in any, any alcohol, any spirit, um, grape spirit, like in the other two regions, but uh, only after we have a, a dry, completely dry base wine. The difference between this wine and, and the previous one is that uh, here we bring the alcohol up to above 17%. So we go two points higher. Remember, remember Fino was around 15%. Here is uh, more toward the 17, 18% mark. So this is a way Jerezanos have to um, make sure that no floor appears on the wines. Um, this is too much alcohol now for any, any floor yeast. Um, so these Olorosos also being uh, potentially fuller, coarser, bigger mouthfeel base wines, these Olorosos now uh, directly exposed to the oxygen are going to develop completely differently. As you can see, and only by the color, we're talking about two different animals here from the same grape. Um, so this is the same grape, the same method. The only difference is that this receives a little more alcohol and prevents that floor from growing. So here we have no oxidation. We have floor contact and the floor effect. Here we have the opposite. We don't have any floor. Uh, the wine stays uh, naturally pristine as it was um, from, from day one, but with all that oxidation in, in a control way that is going to make the wine develop um, very differently. Uh, so we don't have any glycerin here um, or virtually any glycerin, and that's why these wines are so sharp and dry and, and lively and light on the palate. Here, we not only keep all the alcohols and the glycerin um, and the original uh, compounds in the wine, those also get um, concentrated by the evaporation process that takes place in the barrels. So Oloroso the Nuno is a 12 year old average wine. So imagine the amount of concentration here at a rate of, you know, four or five percent loss, uh, mostly water, obviously. Uh, how 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 much you know intensity, um, how much power you you have in these um, uh, dry sherries. Uh, both dry wines definitely is going to be drier, but here this is a a, a fuller. Um, completely different profile, uh, Jerez. Um, uh, this could be your oysters wine, and this is going to be more maybe your, uh, you know, big, uh, hearty, um, coarse um, wine. Um, Olorosos are definitely uh, wines that are uh, showing uh, this robust character and more of the toasty, nutty notes and uh, are ones that are usually enjoyed uh, after the finos. So that's why we had them in, in this order. Um, but uh, in summary, both uh, dry jerefes, um, each of them produce from, both of them produce from the same grape variety, but uh, each of them produce uh, using a slightly different method after fortification. Uh, based on either floor growing on the surface or wines in contact with with oxygen, so that's what uh, that's what we have today. But we're missing another 
10 or 12 glasses that, that we have time to, to show today. Well, thank you, Lucas. Um, appreciate that. And um, I know we're going to have um, you back um, in a couple months. We're going to talk more in depth about all the different sherries. So it'll be a fun night. So, so thank you. And um, so now we're going to um, talk with uh, Paul. And um, he's with Premium Port Wines. You're the US importer for um, Blandy's Madeira. Um, and so, um, Paul. Um, Love it. We'll go ahead and get started. So um, uh, thanks so much for that discovery of, of, of Sherry. Um, that was very interesting. I haven't heard that talk in a while, so it was nice to hear. Uh, it's one of the interesting things about this tasting is that even though all of these are fortified wines, um, they all do have that very much in common. But, you know, when you think about the differences in terroir, the differences in uh, 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 varietal vinification process, aging process, uh, we all have our different ways to kind of get to the end of what we're trying to do. But when we talk about Madeira, I think more importantly, the, the thing to recognize about it is that it is much more a line of process and aging than what I would say port and sherry are related to their varietals and their terroirs, probably. A little bit about the about history of the island. Um, the island of Madeira is up, uh, off the coast of Morocco. Um, it, it was a deserted island and was actually discovered by the Portuguese in 1419. At the time, um, this is all pre-Columbus, of course, uh, the Portuguese were in, uh, uh, investigating the coast of Africa with this idea that potentially there might be an eastern route by sea to get to Asia, um, as opposed to the Columbus idea of eventually going straight across and uh, to get to Asia and eventually bumping into the Americas. So the island was discovered in 1419, and eventually it became a very good way station for supplying boats with fresh water, eventually uh, wine, which was a necessary thing to have, um, not just from a pleasure standpoint, but from a health standpoint. Um, obviously, if you have alcohol in liquid, it, um, it kills bugs. So it helps to make water a little bit more safe to drink after it's been kept uh, on ship for a while. So it was a, a very good place for being able to get your hands on food, water, and wine for eventual journeys that would um, continue around uh, Africa and eventually get to India. So what we look for those kind of places today, right? Food, wine, and water is all we really need. Exactly, all an accident. The next slide, please. So this gives you an idea of what the voyage to India looked like. This was uh, Vasco da Gama's uh, first actual uh, trip where he made it to India. So it gives you a, a sense of the way stations. So um, the wine that was picked up at Madeira um, not only was meant for consumption, but it was uh, also meant to act as ballast on the ships. Um, and because it was so high in acidity, it, uh, it, uh, it prevented scurvy. This is a subtropical island. It's a volcano. And actually, it, uh, an extinct volcano. And if any of you have been to the island of Kauai or know the Hawaiian Islands, it resembles the Hawaiian Islands very, very much. It's about the size of Kauai, so it's fairly small. Um, uh, eventually, what ended up happening was that the wines would be loaded onto the ships. They would make their way all the way to India. So on that first trip, the wines would cross the equator two times. And if the wines were going to be used as ballast on the return trip, those wines would actually um, come back having crossed four times the equator. This is basically the equivalent of you loading a case of Chardonnay in your car in um, Key West in the month of August and driving all the way up to Bangor, Maine very slowly. And you probably wouldn't think that Chardonnay tasted really good by the time that it got back to, uh, to, to Key West. It would be brown, it would be completely oxidized and eventually what we came to call matterized. It got hot, it was heated. And that's really what makes this wine very, very different is that rather than sending these wines on trips all the time to achieve this process, um, the winemakers developed a process on the island of Madeira to replicate that heating and to create something completely new and unique. So let's look at the next slide. Another accident was that this wine became so incredibly important during the American colonial period. It was a very important wine to the colonies. Obviously, um, uh, 
almost all wine was coming over from Europe uh, to the, the, the colonies at that point. When the tax code was written, it was basically written that all goods, including wine, that were coming from the continent needed to pass through British hands to get to the colonies so that they could be taxed. The mistake that was made was that Madeira was not included in that tax code. Now, Madeira is, uh, was discovered by the Portuguese and still to this day, of course, is um, administered by Portugal. So even though technically it was administered by a European country, it was not included in the tax code. So it meant that Madeira was one, less expensive, and if you had a beef with the imperial power, as a lot of people did at the time, drinking Madeira was a very patriotic thing to do. And I particularly chose this, this, um, this image for the slide because it's, it's Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin sitting down arguing about, um, about writing the Declaration of Independence. And you see all those scraps of paper on the ground. It's nice to know that things don't change. I'm sure there's a lot of um, scraps of paper on the ground in Washington where you guys are now. Um, given what's um, trying to be accomplished in Congress right now. So anyway, I thought it was a good image. What happened back then is still happening today. They enjoyed Madeira back in those days and um, we're certainly doing that ourselves. Again, the, the, the key element that I think that makes it so unique and different from the other wines that we're tasting today and from wine in general is that it's the one wine in the world that's purposefully heated and oxidized um, to get to the, the, the desired effect of, of what the wine presents. Which is something most winemakers are actively avoiding okay. heating and oxidation, right? And then Madeira is looking for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So next slide, please. So let's go ahead and taste a little bit of, uh, of this wine. And we'll talk uh, in, in, in the next couple of slides, we'll talk a little more about process, a little more about aging. But um, uh, what you have on the island is about 90% of it is planted to red fruit, a grape called Tinta Negra. A lot of these grapes are not gonna be terribly familiar, but that's okay. It's more about style. So the remaining 10% of fruit is white fruit. And those are the grapes that we know mostly uh, in this country uh, as the, the, the noble varietals for the drier to sweet Madeiras. So in, in, in order of driest to sweet, Cercial is the driest. Um, not at all unlike in a way what you find some of the flavors of, of, of Fino Sherry. It kind of starts there. So you have Cercial is the driest, Gradelu in the middle, um, still on the little drier side, Bual on the sweeter side, more of a dessert wine. And then at the sweetest end of the spectrum, you have Malmsey. Um, and what we're going to taste today, first of all, is we're going to start with a uh, five year Bual. So Bual is um, again a white grape. Uh, the wines are, uh, are, are, grapes are harvested um, and uh, vinified and uh, eventually fortified. A little bit about the fortification process that's different as well. When you're, as, um, as we learned with sherry, those wines are fermented all the way dry before the spirit is added to fortify it. In port, which Adrian is going to address, one gets to a certain level of alcohol, a desired level of alcohol, and then there's a fortification. Whereas with Madeira, we don't really fortify according to the level of alcohol, we fortify according to the level of residual sugar. So it's a very different measurement and a different um, approach. And the reason why we go about doing that is that because each grape varietal not only has a particular varietal characteristic, but they have sweetness styles and sweetness levels that you shoot to achieve. Um, and, with, uh, and with this particular wine with Wall, uh, you're looking at about 100 grams per liter of residual sugar, uh, a little bit at the top end of the spectrum for what's allowed with wall, but that's what we're looking to do. Mm. To me, wall is a perfect example of what, it's a glass of creme brulee. You know, it's got caramel, it's got that vanilla quality to it. It's got a nice zing of sweetness, but really, what really kicks in is in the finish, is you get this wonderful zip of acidity, which is really due to this volcanic soil that you have on the island. Before these wines are actually fortified, if you taste the base wines, they're tough. They're hard as nails. They are so incredibly tart, basically, you know, practically undrinkable, very, very hard. Um, but what actually makes them more desirable 
and attractive is the fact that they get heated and that they get oxidized. So it, the, all the things that are aberrant to every other winemaker in the world are those things which make um, Madeira really attractive. If the wines did not have this level of acidity um, and, and, you, and you put them through this, this process, um, they would completely lose balance. It's only because of the level of acid um, that works very, very well with the sugar and the, um, the oxidation and, and give it a, quite, a kind of a unique quality to it. So um, are there any yeah. still wines made out of these grapes in Madeira? There are. There's some, there's some folks that are making um, white wines uh, out of Verdun. And, um, and actually, Blandy's is doing this. Uh, they're making uh, white wines out of Verdun, and they're making red wine, or excuse me, rosé, out of Tinta Negra. And they're very interesting. And they're, they get shown in a lot of tastings where people are looking at volcanic um, uh, regions across the world. So uh, you're seeing them um, getting that level of, of, of exposure, but it's, it's very early days for those wines. It's, it's only been a couple of years that they've been in production. And honestly, uh, they're, they're predominantly sold on the island uh, and a little bit in mainland Portugal. They, they, they haven't really gotten worldwide distribution at this point, but you got to start somewhere, right? Right. So I always find it, I mean, you know, last time I was in Spain, I had some still, um, still wines from, from Heath. So it was very interesting to taste them you know, they're, they're the roots. And, you know, I've done that also with the Duros, you know, had the Triga Nacional as a single varietal uh, still wine, but I've not done that yet with any of the, uh, the Madeira uh, varietals. So I'll have well, to- the, um, name of the, brand is, the name of the brand is Atlantis. Atlantis. So, you know, look it up and see if you can track some down and um, it, you have yourself a fun, uh, a fun little afternoon of tasting those, they're, they're fun. Very fun, thank you. Let's taste the, uh, let's look at the next slide. Please. So kind of going back to a little bit about what this place is about, this is a very good example of the small scale of agriculture that's done on the island. There are hundreds of growers. Um, you can see when you look at this landscape, you look at the cliffs and the greenness around, you know, it's a very wet island. And this is on the North shore, which is the, the, the side that gets most of the rain. Um, it's incredibly lush. Uh, it's called the garden island by many people because you can basically you know, grow anything there. This vineyard is planted in an espalier um, system. Um, most of the older traditional vineyards are planted uh, basically with a pergola system where you uh, uh, get as, the grapes as high off the ground as possible. Uh, when you're dealing with a seaside location like this, the, the problem with, um, uh, with mold can be you know, a real issue. But when you look at the size of this vineyard, it gives you a real good sense of the, the size and the scale of agriculture that's there. You know, all of the vineyards pretty much are under a hectare. So it's incredibly small scale. And, um, uh, and again, I would say, you know, unlike some of the other trades that we're talking about today, the other uh, areas, this is completely a negociant um, driven region. Um, the, the difficulty and the scale of the agriculture doesn't make sense for people to try and create estates or home vineyards uh, to base their production on. There are a couple of small examples, but um, by no means large enough to give production to predominate in a, uh, in, in a winery's uh, production. So that's a little bit about the, the vineyards and give you a sense of the, the coastline. So next slide, please. Uh, we have one question that came in about the ball. Is it, yeah, this is a five-year ball. Do you make them in other, other years? We do. So pretty much with all of our range, in all of our ones, we make all four varietals of the, of the noble grapes. We make them all in a five-year, a 10-year. Uh, uh, some we do a 15-year. And in all of them, we make what is called a colheta, which is a Portuguese word meaning harvest. And that indicates that the wine came from uh, one single harvest. If the wine's in barrel for less than 20 years, we call it a colheta. If it's in a, a barrel for longer than 20 years, it gets bottled as in what in Portuguese is called garafeira, but in this country, we call them vintage Madeiras. Um, that's how they're predominantly made. But we take all four varietals and we do make multiple uh, age levels and price levels, of course, for each of them. And those are the ones, I mean, if you go to Portugal, I mean, I've seen them in the, in the markets, you can see the, 
you know, incredibly old Madeiras. You can find them back into the early 1900s easily. And, and you know, the oldest one I've ever had is a Madeira. I had a 1912 Madeira. It was a Magnum. Um, Amazing. And it was still kind of needed a little more age on it. It was still. You know, it's kind of funny, like a lot of things, once you put them in bottle, the, the aging process pretty much stops. Right. Um, but, the, but the island had a really difficult history where, you know, it, it got hit with phylloxera, like everybody. And then they had a horrible powdery mildew problem. And after that, America was, of course, the biggest market because it was a big tradition of bringing this wine in this country. When Prohibition hit, it was the third nail in the coffin. And it really put Madeira out of business to a great degree. So what you had was all this amazing wine from the late 19th century and the early 20th century that didn't have a market. So it was all sitting there in barrel for years and years and years. And then a couple of English wine merchants and a couple of Americans went over to the island for a holiday. You know, at that time, it was a fairly staid place to go. They called it, you know, Madeira was the island where you, you know, it was the home of the, the newlywed and the nearly dead. <laughs> so it was all honeymooners and retirees, right? Hip people weren't going to the island at the time. So for someone in the wine trade, that had an interest in really promoting these, they were, you know, these people were uh, pioneers. And guys like Bart Broadbent and a couple of other folks um, started bringing very interesting older Madeiras to this country and marketing them. And they were cheap because, you know, they were just sitting in barrel and, you know, they bottle up a little bit of it here and there and it would get sold in the UK and the United States and they weren't terribly expensive. But um, nowadays, you know, you look at, 19th century Madeiras, they, they cost an arm and a leg. They're, they're pretty, they're not as high as Bordeaux, um, but you can drink that Madeira. Right. And I'm not so sure that that bottle of Bordeaux will have you know, lasted the course. So we're gonna have to create, um, Greg, you're gonna have to make a Coravin that can keep a bottle of Bordeaux that's going from 1895 all the way to now. So <laughs> when we achieve that, that will be a, 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 big, uh, a big bit. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, again, about process. So again, the grapes are, are selected, destemmed. The fermentation takes place in, a, in a, what you would look at as a normal winery, stainless steel tanks. Uh, and the weird part that happens here is that for some grape varieties, the fermentation lasts very, very long. So the ones that we're making in the sweeter styles, they already have a lot of residual sugar. And if we're going to add a fortification um, element to it, they don't need to ferment for a long time to get alcohol. So a Malmsey, for instance, only needs to go through a 24 hour fermentation. Whereas say like a Cercial, you've got to ferment that thing dry pretty much. So it takes a little bit longer to go through it. So ironically, the dry ones are the ones that go through the longer fermentation before they get fortified. It's a little the inverse of what happens in other places. So um, next slide, please. So let's taste the Malmsey. So Malmsey is just essentially a, 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 an anglified version of, of Malazia. So uh, a lot of these grapes, you know, pretty much either came from mainland Portugal, uh, and some of those obviously have origin in some other places like Crete. Um, again, the, this example is a little bit different from the wall in the fact that it's higher in residual sugar. If you see here, it's 123 grams per liter versus the 100 that we had with the Bois, um, which again for Blandies is a little bit on the sweeter side uh, and that seems to be more the house style. The other thing about this wine is that it was aged longer. So this is an example of a wine that was in barrel for 10 years. And again, it's a blend. you change the RS for different markets? No, no, that's uh, it's standard. There are, I will say there are a number of wines that Blandies makes that are exclusive to the UK and the continent that we don't do in the United States. They, there's a, um, a, a, a line of uh, three-year Madeiras, uh, Tinta Negra, that are done in different styles, um, referring to um, you know, Duke of Clarence uh, and a couple of other um, uh, characters out of Shakespeare. But we don't sell them in the US. Um, when I taste Malmsey, the flavor differences between it and Wall are pretty distinct. You know, to me, Wall is the creme brulee of, of the Madeira world, caramel, 
um, vanilla, burnt sugar kind of uh, elements to it. Uh, Malmsey, on the other hand, is the tiramisu. It's got coffee, it's got chocolate, um, it's darker. The, the fruit is almost more tropical, banana um, kind of flavors. Uh, uh, I think one of the things about these wines that, you know, when you taste them, it's the finish that's just so amazing to them. And whether I'm tasting port, table wines from, you know, Germany, America, wherever, uh, one of the things that makes a, a huge impact on me is, is length. And it really says to me so much about what someone has invested in that wine, um, whether it be from the vineyard, from the winemaking, from the aging, it's, it's, to me, it's a sign of something that's really, really, really been, been cared for. And that's one of the things that I always remark about Madeira uh, when I taste them is in particular in the 10 year range, you get this wonderful, beautiful length. And again, where I, you know, I pair the wall with creamy cheeses, um, you know, it's, there's a Portuguese cheese called Serra that maybe a couple of you have had before. Um, there's a, a, a more available version in the States called Seia, S-E-I-A, that has kind of got this, this wall written all over it. You know, whereas cheeses that maybe have a little more harder, drier character um, would make a lot more sense from Malmsey. Uh, there's, you know, the island cheeses from Portugal do very, very nicely with this. Um, uh, South George is one that, uh, that you can get over here. There's even a family in, up in Marin County um, called the Matos family that makes a St. George version of the island cheese here in um, California that uh, is a, a, a fantastic wine, excuse me, cheese to go with this, uh, with this wine. Absolutely delicious. So in this country, Malti is probably the best known of the varietals that's used uh, and the bottling from Blandies that you see um, most commonly in restaurants and in uh, restaurants. Paul, what temperature so would you serve these wines? Oh, sorry, John. Go ahead, Greg. I'm just interested. I, what temperature would you serve these guys? I mean, I had them in my, my red wine fridge. Should I keep them in my white wine fridge? What's the I keep them in your white wine fridge and put them in a room temp stem uh, and let them come to, you know, let them warm up just a smidge, you know, particularly in the warmer months, um, because all of these wines are a little bit higher in alcohol. There's nothing more, you know, bothersome than getting a glass that's 85, 90 degrees and you put a, a fortified wine in it and it comes to a table at a restaurant and you put your nose in it and you get nothing but alcohol. And that's a little frustrating. So I find that if you can just um, keep the wine cooler, particularly in the warmer months, when it hits a room temp stem, by the time it gets to the table, it's just right. Uh, and I was gonna ask, is there a particular reason why you do this one in a 500 mil as opposed to 750, just economics or? It's a good price point, you know? Okay, that works. It's you know, <laughs> We're, we know where everybody's in it to make um, a living out of it. So well, that, right. it's, it's a business, you know? Right, right. You know, if you wanted the winemaker, I should have gotten him. Unfortunately, you got the salesman. <laughs> so just to give you a sense of um, how these wines are aged. So we talked a little bit about how they're made. What happens after the wine goes through the, the fermentation and the fortification, they are then brought to these barrels. Um, they're much larger than what you find for table wine. These are 650 liters. And rather than keeping them in a cellar where it's nice and cool, as you would find in Burgundy or you know, many other winemaking areas, we don't put wines in the, in the cellar. We put them in the attic. Literally, this is right under the eaves of the, the, uh, the building, the, the lodge in Funchal on the island. So the wines go into the hottest part of uh, the, 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 the lodge to start their aging process. And you've got to think of the lodge as it's basically three floors. And each of those floors, you think of them as like a flat top grill. You have hot spots, you have cool spots, you have medium spots. And what the winemaker's job is to do is to know the progression of put them in a hot spot for a while, move it, then we put it in a cool spot, then we put it to a steady spot, then you put it back to a hot spot. So there's a constant moving around of these barrels to get the desired effect of the heat and the oxygen. Eventually the wines will, will go further down into the cooler areas. And, um, and then as they reach their, um, their uh, designated age of uh, five, 10, 15 years, then they're blended and, uh, and bottled and sent out into the market. 
So you so actually this is move called, the barrels, or do you just pump yeah, it down? Well, well, the wine gets moved, actually, out of the barrels okay. from different, the different spots. So, so, I don't, so um, that would be amazing to watch the 650 no, no, barrels. No, no there's not a, not a major winch system in there, the, moving the, the barrels. It's the wine that gets transferred from one to another. Um, this is what's called the Cantero, the Cantero system. There's another system called um, estufaje, which literally means stewing, if you will, or, or it's like a greenhouse effect uh, where, where the wines of lower tier that are aged for three years, most commonly known as rainwater in this country, are, uh, are heated artificially in tank. So uh, those wines are at an entry level price uh, and trying to uh, manage them in cask is not practical, uh, but all of the wines that are five year and older are ones that are going to be aged in this process. So the two wines that you have today, plus most of the wines that you see here in the United States made from white fruit are all going to be done in this method as opposed to the estufage. There we are. Adrian, take it away. Thank you, Paul. So Adrian, um, Peter Fladgate, um, let's um, talk about some ports. Oh, thank you, John. Thank you, Paul, very much. Lovely to see you all. and. Um, Nice to be here on a on a, a very early Friday morning uh, to taste through some great ports. Yes, thank you so much for staying <laughs> up um, tonight. He is actually it's kind in of interesting. We we played from sort of east coast, west coast, and then right back here to 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 mainland Portugal. But uh, it's a, it's great to be with you. And it looks very time. bright out behind you. So it's well, yeah. I want to just talk about that. I was I you know I had uh, I was. Um, in fact, if we put up the next slide, so it kind of explains what it's all about. So this is where I live and work, which is in the town of Porto, uh, right on the Atlantic Ocean. And um, and I put up both brands there. I mean, Taylor Flankett's what we're known as in the United States. Taylor's is what we're known as in much of the rest of the world. And the kind of the story, it's, a, it's an odd story around that because, you know, we were founded back in uh, 1692. So, you know, 329 years ago. Um, we the business was set up, but it was only around 100 years ago that we tried to register the brand in the uh, United States. And uh, we found that a couple of years before somebody had registered the name Taylor's. So as a result, you know, we've been Taylor, we've been Taylor Flankgate now for about 100 years since uh, since we, we really introduced these wines to uh, North America. But where we're based is Porto, and that's the, the town that gives its uh, name to these wines. It's one of only three wines in the world that, that are really named after a single town. So you have wines of Bordeaux, you have wines of Jerez or Cherez, um, Sherry, Sherry wines, Jerez, and then wines of Porto. And uh, that's where we are. But we're, we're kind of unusual because, um, you know, this is where I live and work. Um, and this is where the wines are stored and aged, but the vineyards are around about 100 miles to the interior up the Douro River. And if you look on the next slide, what you'll see is the sort of change of landscape that we get as you move up the Douro uh, to this more interior region, which has very steep hills, uh, very sort of wild countryside. Um, not that many people live up there. I mean, 80% of the Portuguese people live within 20 miles of the sea. So we're, we're very much a sort of nation that, that, that lives on our coastline. And, and the borders as a result, the borders of Portugal really haven't changed for well over a thousand years. So we're one of the, a very old country with very stable uh, borders. And that's because in the interior, we get to care, kind of very remote regions. And um, this picture that you see behind uh, me today, uh, it, or the picture you see behind me, was one I took today uh, in uh, Quinta de Rueda. Um, it's got the um, the flowering of the wisteria plant, so always something I associate with uh, Easter is wisteria is out and incredible smells, uh, but also a steva, which is a wild sort of gum cistus. Uh, a plant that has a very pungent smell and you have all these aromatic plants that are out at this time of the year and it's a very beautiful time to visit and I know as we go on a little bit later on this call we're going to talk to all of you about what makes our sort of uh, particular areas very interesting to visit. But right now we're going to focus on on the wines itself and obviously I want to draw attention to why 
port is different from Sherry and is different from Madeira. And um, as you've heard uh, so far in the call, the uh, process of when spirit is added and, and, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the wines is a very crucial factor in, in the process. And for us, um, spirit has a very critical part to play in the manufacture of port because essentially what happens is we grow our grapes, we bring them in, we ferment them, and then about halfway through the fermentation, we artificially stop that fermentation. And we do that by adding the neutral grape spirit. What it does is it raises the alcohol from around about 7% to around about 20%, and that kills off all the yeast cells and leaves us with a lot of uh, unfermented um, grape sugar. And, and, and in a sense, that's why port is sweet. And if we look at the next slide, what you'll see is the sort of extraordinary uh, remote hillsides that uh, make up uh, the Douro region. So this is a river that, that flows right off the Pyrenees. It's about 800 and 20 kilometers long. So uh, whatever that is in miles, about 550 miles, uh, flowing right across Northern Spain into Portugal. And as it gets to, to Portugal itself, um, it ends up uh, carving its way through this extraordinary landscape that's made up from uh, a sedimentary rock called schist. Um, schist is always, <laughs> early on in a tasting, I always like to get that out. Schist is the soil that is the sedimentary soil um, which laid down millions of years ago in, a, in the bed of a lake that through, through historical time has kind of moved from the um, horizontal, horizontal to the vertical. And that is really crucial because it allows the, the roots of our vines to kind of push their way down 20 or 30 feet into the soil, into the rock, in order to get to the moisture which allows them to live. And, and, and the truth is that in any... Um, wine region of the world, uh, probably the harder the vine has to struggle to survive, the better the quality of wine that it makes. And, it, and it's kind of interesting that you know, we talk about Hereth and, and, and very, you know, uh, calcaric soils, very chalky soils where incredible intense heat in the summer, vines really struggling to survive or sitting on volcanic rock out in the middle of the Atlantic, really, really having fighting to survive, or up in the Dura Valley, Valley exactly the same sort of process uh, taking place. And as a result, what you get is, is uh, vines that produce a fairly small crop, very concentrated. And it's from that that we get the, these wonderful wines, this sort of expression of the sort of terroir and the minerality and the sense of, of what our wines are all about. And if we jump on to the uh, next slide, what we should see um, is, is a hero wine, which we're going to put into our, oh, where are we now? Um, we're going to come to that. Okay, so here's, let's just look. This is uh, some pictures, some harvesting going on. Uh, one point to make is that in our region, everything is on a steep uh, slow hillside. So as a result, pretty much everything is done by hand, including all of our picking that allows us to make sure that all the grapes come in in perfect condition and anything that, that isn't perfect, that you know, the pickers simply don't pick, carried off those hillsides, brought down um, into the winery. And you'll see in the next picture uh, that the uh, process of winemaking that we still use uh, here um, is it harks back thousands of years. I mean, the Romans were using this technology of the human foot treading on grapes in order to extract the color and the flavor. And the reason that we do that is really, really simple. And that is that um, if you think of a, a grape, a, a red grape, uh, you know, if you peel the grape, and I'm sure many of you every day peel your red grapes in order to make sure that they're, they're in perfection. Uh, but you know, the color's in the skin. And if you peel a red grape, inside is a white flesh. And that's why fantastic champagnes of the world are made from Pinot Noir, a red grape, because the color is in the skin. And it's the inside, you have the flesh, the moisture, the liquid, which is what we need to make wine. But 
it's the skin itself that's got a lot of color and a huge amount of flavor. And what we need to do in making port is we've got to crush those uh, skins, extract all that color and extract all that flavor in a very, very short period of time because between picking and the process of, of uh, adding the neutral grape spirit, spirit, which is what you're seeing in the uh, lower corner here um, with that clear liquid being added in, that's, that's alcohol at 77% uh, alcohol by volume. So 154 proof uh, probably makes a pretty mean um, to keep a, a sort of a, a pretty mean cocktail actually, if you have that neat, but the, Strong alcohol, and what that's doing is, is it's stopping the fermentation. It's raising um, the alcohol level up, killing off all the natural um, yeast cells and leaving unfermented grape sugar. And, and kind of that's the, that's the point about port is that um, we get left with unfermented grape sugar, that natural sweetness in the wine that comes from it. What you also see on this uh, slide is, is um, a modern tank that is trying to replicate what the human foot is doing because simply we don't have the labor force available these days to be able to tread on every grape. But we as a company still believe that that foot treading process actually manages to extract the a little bit more structure, a little bit more intensity. We kind of don't know the exact secret to it, but but it's worked for us for the last 300 years and we're continuing to do it. But not many grapes anywhere in the world are trodden by the human foot. And again, uh, when we get on to the section about uh, what, what is a reason to come and visit uh, any particular wine region, one of it is to see uh, foot treading in the harvest. I'm sure so, we can get some volunteers here to come and help you out <laughs> on next harvest. So. Thank you, John. We're looking forward to that. So, so what does this really mean uh, when we get to the wines themselves? And I think, you know, what, I, what, I, what we want to do, obviously, is, is take a look at the uh, first port that we've got. We've got two ports tonight. And the interesting point for everybody, um, you know, listening is, is to emphasize that both of these ports were essentially made from the same vineyards, the same way with the same foot treading. The difference has come through the aging process. So the first one we have, which is the, um, is the, the Taylor Flatgate late bottle vintage. Uh, this has been aged in a large uh, wooden uh, vat. Uh, in the image on the screen here, you see something that's uh, about 100,000 liters, which has got the brand uh, Taylor's or Taylor Flatgate on the front of it. And, and the idea here is you've got a large volume of liquid with very little surface area of wood. So what, what happens is you retain a lot of the fresh berry fruit flavors. You get this, you know, this lovely black currant blackberry, the, the sort of plums and all those sort of flavors in this wine. And then when you, when you taste it, you get that follow through of this lovely intensity. You get these sort of notes and hints of uh, dark chocolate, a little bit of spice, a little bit of uh, white pepper, all of these things which are kind of rich. And, and when you're tasting this, you're thinking, hmm, this is going to go incredibly well with chocolate. This is going to go very well with a stronger flavored cheese because um, this particular port, which is five years old, um, is, is, is put into a bottle uh, to order. So, you know, this is one of the great things about Greg's um, invention is that we sell this with uh, a stopper cork. So you take out our stopper cork, you put Greg's stopper cork in, and, and as a result, the, the Pivo system, you know, pops straight in the top here, um, and you can basically serve straight from the bottle. So really a good um, connection there between what we've been doing for many years and, and, and the Coravan system, which, which helps to preserve uh, this wine. But we, we, we tend to marry this with these bigger fruit flavors uh, and, and so on. And, and as I say, this large wooden vat that we're aging in, preserving all those lovely rich berry fruit flavors um, and, and delicious at the end of the meal. Now, am, I correct, say, sorry, am I correct with the, with the late bottle vintage? That is something that Taylor Fladgate brought to market, correct? 
You are correct. Yeah. So, 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 what happened in the port industry is, is kind of interesting because the port industry used to be sort of vintage port and ruby port, and there wasn't much in between. And um, you know, when Alistair Robertson, my my father-in-law, who was you know, the generation before my wife and I running this business, um, you know, when he came came out, you know, was here in Portugal in nineteen, joined out here in 1967 when after Dick Yateman had died. And um, he was kind of looking at the industry saying, you know, everybody wants to drink these wines with this rich flavor and so on and so forth, but they're really concerned about opening vintage port um, and, and, and not necessarily being able to drink the whole of the bottle. So what are we gonna do? And, and his answer to it was to produce something which was called late bottle vintage. So vintage, a wine from a single year, which is why we use the name vintage. But instead of being bottled when it's two years old, which you normally do with a vintage port, this is bottled when it's about five years old. And that extra time in wood means it's ready to um, be served straight away. Um, it doesn't throw a deposit. It, vintage port itself uh, tends to interact much more with air because when you bottle anything, when you bottle them young and they're, they're aged in absence of oxygen, oxygen will tend to change a wine. Um, and that's why, you know, the original system, which, which I think, you know, Greg would probably, I hope you can see this in front of me, but, you know, Greg might call this a dinosaur, but, but the original concept of this was great, was that by putting argon on top of the wine in order to extract it from the bottle meant that it wasn't connected to oxygen. So therefore, that's why this system allowed you to taste a wine where, at a whatever stage and still have it as the winemaker intended it. Um, when you put it in a, in a big vat, there is going to be a little bit of aging. And that's why after five years, we came up you know, with this thing called late bottle vintage. So it was vintage style, but after five years, ready to drink, we put it through a, a, um, a, a process of uh, cold stabilization, drops out any sediment. And, and, you know, we would typically think of something like this as uh, being, you know, once you open it, any good to drink for in, 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 in over the course of a, a sort of week from opening. You put the pivot system in, then you're going to be, this is great to drink over the course of, you know, four to six weeks. And, and that additional time means that you can look at a bottle of this and think, okay, I can, I can, you know, enjoy that, you know, a glass a week over the course of a month or two and, and have it all in perfect condition. That's the great thing about the pivot system. But essentially, that was the idea originally behind um, late bottle vintage, which is vintage port itself needs to be enjoyed pretty much on its first night. And when Alistair came up with late bottle vintage in 1970. Here's something suddenly that you could enjoy over a course of a week. So in a way, late bottle vintage was a response to the, the uh, dilemma that many wine enthusiasts have had, which is how do I get a great bottle of wine to last a little bit longer? Technology is, is producing, you know, the pivot or, or the dinosaur. Um, <laughs> but but it's it's the same the same issue from a consumer's perspective, which is how do I get this wine to last a little bit longer? Late bottle vintage is what we did. It's been a huge success, and and we've been um, you know beneficiaries of that, I guess, all the way uh, through this period of time. But we also sell something called um, you know aged tawnies, and I've got here the the twenty year old uh, aged tawny again. Uh, we use a, a, tool, uh, a, a stopper cork on, on this particular one. 20 years of aging, but in this case, in a small cask, something um, about 600 litres. So what uh, we were hearing from uh, in the Stufas of Madeira, um, that sort of size. And, and that's a really good size where you've got a, a sort of 600 liters, you've got a large surface area of wood compared to the volume of the wine. So you're gonna get more evaporation, you get more concentration. Uh, that's why it works so well as a size in Madeira. Works incredibly well here in the, in the town of Porto to shift the style from the, the sort of bigger fruity flavors that we find in the late bottle vintage now to the more um, 
dried fruit aromas. So when we put this on our nose, we're going to get we're going to get the white raisins. We're going to get the um, notes of uh, perhaps some some nuttiness. Um, we're going to be thinking that this is certainly, uh, in a sense, drier because that's how it smells on the nose. Technically, of course, after 20 years of aging um, in the in in the in the cask, um, and as you know, Paul talked about this. I think was this concentration effect that takes place. In fact, I mean, one liter of this 20 years ago started off as two liters. So we've lost a whole liter in evaporation, that whole concentration process. But what's effectively taken place is, is, is a controlled evaporation that produces these lovely nuanced, rich flavors um, and, and, and very dried fruit. So when we taste this, I hope you get, you know, a shift away from the, the black currant blackberry into now nuts and raisins and sweetness and dried apricots and all those sorts of flavors. So as soon as we taste this, we think, okay, instead of late bottle vintage going, let's say, with the chocolate or whatever, this is now going to go with, with, say, an apple pie, or this is going to go with a creme brulee, or this is, this is um, you know, if I'm having cheese, the first the late bottle vintage might go with my Stilton, but this, this is crying out for creamier cheese or maybe a cheese with higher acidity, like a goat's cheese where, the, the, you know, and, and I think that's one of the great pleasures of all wine and all the wines we're tasting tonight is that we can think about how do we pair the wine with the food? How do we put, you know, one plus one uh, to get three with the experience of marrying these, these, these flavors of food and wine together and adding that the, the ambiance of, of a dinner and friends and, and everything else that, that, that we're all post COVID crying out to do, you know, to be together. And, 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 you know, and to that extent for me, you know, and I've got, I've got the pivot system here and I've popped it in. There we go. A quick report of the 20 year old. And here I am with, with a wine that, you know, for us is, is a tremendous expression of the aging and blending process. It, was started the same way in the vineyard as the LVV, but time has changed it. And that to me is the beauty of this wine. It's the beauty of all these fortified wines that we are tasting today. They come from centuries of experience uh, and testing and bring to everybody, I think, um, the richness of the wine industry. John. Thank you. And I, I do want to say, you know, last time I was um, in, in Porto, you know, I, I did find the... Um, Wonderful. It's empty now, but um, <laughs> uh, it was great because this is what the port bottles used to look like on the ships, so they would not topple over, right? So if you think about the sailing ships, you know, with this, it would not fall over as easy. Um, but um, I, I made sure to bring this bottle back with me. Um, and John, that's one of the um, that's one of the few ways you can make wine in the port industry is you can take a bet with people about the ratio between the circumference of the top against the height of one of those bottles. So if you were to hold that up again so that people could see it, um, what what so that looks as though it's implausible that the circumference around the top below the cork there is actually equal to the height of the bottle. And if you go and try that, huh. um, you should get a one-to-one -one ratio. Okay. And if you do, you'll have something that's that's a proper kind of ship's decanter. Um, and if you make a wager with any of your friends, make a bet with any of your friends as to whether they can get the circumference correct to the height um, and, and put a glass of something good on it, on, on that wager, or put a couple of dollars on it, uh, you're gonna win every time. I'll be sure to do that, yes. So um, thank you, Adrian. So let's see. Um, uh, Greg said, yeah, these are the bottles, the first modern wine bottle designed from the 1600s. Yeah, so so um, Adrian, um, I know because you're much, much lighter than we are. So why don't we skip ahead um, and let you talk a little bit more about um, um, Porto um, as, a, as, a, um, as a visitor to the, to the region, so. Okay, well, I know, John, you've got some, some slides there, which, um, 
which kind of give a, a little bit of a, a, an idea of what's uh, available here. But I think I think uh, what I want to, to obviously say to everybody who's on this call is that, um, you know, visiting the, the, the location itself, whether it be in, in Jerez or San Luca or, or in um, Madeira, or wherever that one actually goes to, to visit a wine region, I think you have this opportunity to, to not just see how the wine itself is made, but to understand the history, the climate, uh, the people that are behind these wines. And, and for me personally, and, and I, I say this not just because I'm, I've been in the wine industry for 30 years, um, I think wine is a great roadmap to discover any wine region. Because inevitably, the style of wine that's being made is influenced by the climate, the history, and that perhaps influences the sort of food that people consume. And so when you can get to any region, you can really get into the, the heart and soul and have this, this proper engagement. And I think that's hugely important. And, and wherever I've traveled around the world, um, and, and I'm fortunate enough, you know, in, in my job to, to get to go and visit many wine regions, every single one is, is as distinctly different as a place to visit as the wines themselves are uh, to taste. And so when we're talking about visiting Porto, you know, I just really want to, I've got a few slides here, just put out a little bit of a flavor to everybody. Um, this particular one is a shot that's taken from something called the Hotel Yateman, which is um, a hotel uh, opened about 10 years ago. It was something, uh, it, you know, my, we have three children. My wife says those are her babies and the Yateman's my baby. Um, th there's probably a lot of truth in that. This, uh, this is a, a property. I do remember when you were building this, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, this, this, we, we've been blessed by being uh, a very old business in the center of the city. We've got a lot of great land and how do you use it to the best effect? And we've decided that given that this is our home, uh, rather than sell off land and which might be tempted by many people, we've kind of said, no, let's turn this into something that really would allow, you know, our generations now and in the future to, to visit and really experience what, what we love about the city. So, um, you know, here you have a shot from the Yateman looking out over the historic port lodges across to the town of Porto. Uh, the River Duro here is, 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 is fairly narrow, but it's right by the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, in the morning, you might get Atlantic mists flowing up the river that just shades part of the lower part of the city, uh, an extraordinary experience. And if we move through these slides, we'll do it fairly quickly, but I just want to give you a sense here of the traditional port lodges um, that exist. And, and as we move through that to uh, look here at a hotel, this is, again, this is the Yateman where I've tried to create an experience that uniquely gives a sense of the flavor of the city of Porto. So whether that be the wines, and this, by the way, important to say that the Yateman actually has been picked out by a number of magazines around the world as probably having the best Portuguese wine lists in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because we have every single wine region of Portugal represented there. Uh, we have the best producers. So all of the people that are on this uh, call are there because it, actually not just about Portugal, we also show great wines from the Iberian Peninsula. And we've got a two-star Michelin uh, restaurant. The idea is a celebration of, of the life and culture of, of wine. And that's why some of the rooms, as you can see there, you get the oddity of being able to sleep in a, in a, large, in a large barrel or a large vat. I mean, how strange is that? But, is it a new one or did you actually things. use it for anything. Now that that was used to to age port for a number of years. Uh, that's been there now, the bed's been there, the, the structure's been there for 10 years. It no longer smells that strongly, <laughs> that strongly of port, but it still smells of port. Um, you get people so, licking yeah, the barrel then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, you know, the coop, that was built by our coopers uh, yeah. from an existing an existing vat that we had. So if we shoot forward a little bit, just to give you a flavor of the Duro itself, I mean, a very dramatically beautiful wine region. And I'm sure that 
you know, um, colleagues on the call here are going to talk about quite rightly about the beauty of Madeira, or the beauty of Jerez, all of which are very distinctive. Uh, I think the Douro Valley itself uh, is fairly unique um, and has an immense amount of charm. And that's why we ask people to come and see these things, because perhaps only you are the best judges uh, to, to, to what, what is the best Rhine region. And after all, one of the charms of, of Jerez, Madeira, Porto, the Douro, is that that's quite a sensible trip in, in, uh, over the space of seven to 10 days. You can go to all these regions because there are uh, interconnected flights between them. So this is a hotel called the Vintage House, right on the edge of the River Douro, uh, right in the heart of the region. We roll forward on these slides. And um, I can tell you that, you know, we were supposed to do a fortified tour last year in 20, where we actually were booked into Porto, Jerez, and Madeira. Um, but we will be repeating that. Well, we didn't, re we didn't do it. We will be doing that tour um, in 22. So, uh, you know, if everybody's watching, if you want to join us, um, we will go in... Um, Drink, drink with Adrian and Lucas and Paul um, in each of those each of those locations. So, yeah, I think that John, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's the great point is that you can you can get e between these regions fairly easily, and um, and 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 the amazing thing is they're fairly close by. I mean, yes, we're talking about extraordinary differences of wines of which we're able to enjoy, a, you know, with the Caravan Pivot system, but but these wines themselves are um, fairly close geographically and yet so vastly different in, in their history and experience and approach to wine making, making. And yet, you know, this is, this is, this is the richness of, of what we do. So here you get some pictures of, of that hotel, the vintage house on the River Douro. We move you forward and we give you an image um, of uh, the city of Porto itself. This is a hotel called Hotel Infanta Sags, the first five-star property um, right in the heart of the, of the city of Porto, which uh, has recently been renovated. A very exciting property, well worth um, well worth visiting. Stay there a few times, I have to admit. I'm, uh, I'm conflicted, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> there we have some detail on it. So we move forward. I mean, just, look, they don't make stuff like this these days. So, you know, this is where history collides and makes the richness. But this is the, the most recent, the most exciting uh, project in the town. It's one that, that I've been deeply involved in for seven years. It's called the World of Wine. Um, and it has this main central square looking out over the city. What's nice about this, I think, is that it tells a more generic story about wine and winemaking. Uh, we have a museum dedicated to cork of which Portugal is hugely important. Southern Spain, very important in cork uh, trees as well. Um, and, and after all, globally, the, the wine industry uses an awful lot of cork. So um, we, we have that. We have a, another museum dedicated to the history of the region. We have another one which quite, well, has a personal collection uh, of mine. Um, <laughs> talking about the last 9,000 years of uh, drinking vessels. So uh, the oldest item in my collection is from the Yamon culture in uh, Japan, uh, which was used for serving wine uh, 9,000 years ago. And um, yeah, that's, there's a small museum in this complex dedicated to that. So you can kind of see all these things. Again, the point about visiting the point about something like the world of wine is the fact that you can encounter this richness. And I think for me, you know, one of the, the charming points about the wine trade in general across the globe is the generosity that people have towards talking about their region and, and, um, and sharing that with visitors. And as we just quickly roll through the rest of these, you know, this just shows you a bit of a sense of diversity within the world of wine drinking vessels big there we are some different spaces some imagery and some detail on the wine experience itself so this is this is about twenty five thousand square foot uh, just dedicated to wine explaining to people how wine itself um, all over the world is made 
um, but using specifics of Portugal to, to help uh, guide people. And in the next image, what we'll see is the fact that on that location, we've got a chocolate factory. Again, chocolate, extraordinary story. I mean, so few people in the world realize that to make chocolate, you have to go through fermentation. You know, yes. to make wine, you have to go through fermentation. To make chocolate, you have to go through fermentation. All the great things in life, you have to go through fermentation. There we Even go. conversations, we have to go through fermentation. <laughs> Here we have it. And, um, you know, but that's there. And, and we talk about wine and chocolate pairing. And as we roll through, um, we've got, yeah, look, there's the drinking vessels. John, we're going to skip through because I know lots of people. There we are. We've actually got fashion design because it's an important industry in the north here and i want to tell the story about that so um you know the, the there's some restaurants and i the next picture is going to be some food to make everyone hungry there you are so look the point basically being is the destination porto is a gateway to the duro valley but also to many other wine regions of portugal it's easy to get to of course the world is closed flights have changed everything is complex right now we all understand that but i think that that when we look at our little bucket list of what we want to do when when the world gets back to normal, um, I think coming down to 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 here uh, hopefully will be rewarding. And what I would say to you is that the quality and depth of content that exists has always been good, but it's recently been added to. Um, and you know beyond that, I think it's time to have a merry Easter. Happy Easter to all of you Cheers. with a quick glass of something. I don't know, we haven't, we're going to get, we've got a lot of wines to celebrate here. So uh, cheers to everybody. Thanks cheers. for tuning in. And um, yeah, we're, uh, we're early on Friday, Easter Friday. So <laughs> lovely to see you all. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so let's go back quick. I know we're running uh, behind schedule, but let's, um, Lucas, let's talk a little bit about Hedeth quick. Um, Sure. Back up here. So yeah, here. I mean, uh, as Adrian was saying, many reasons uh, why you should be coming, visiting Jerez. Um, gastronomy by itself, you know, the food is incredible, right? The the seafood, um, some of the best uh, tuna fish you can you can find in the world. I mean, actually, Japanese come here to to fish uh, for a lot of uh, the, the, the tuna they, they consume. So uh, extraordinary um, seafood and, and, and vegetables and anything you can think of to, to go with, with the wines um, from, from, you know, uh, from appetizers to, to, to desserts um, because you can do all that with, with Jerez. You don't need to, to drink anything else to enjoy a, a long tasting tasting menu. These wines again um, range from one end of the spectrum to all the way to the other, and uh, it's it's um, really fascinating experience with you when you taste these wines with food. We 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 always recommend and enjoying sherry uh, at your favorite time of the day, um, but. Um, I always uh, push for some sort of food to go with the wines because that's when they really, really shine. So uh, gastronomy will be just one excuse to, to get um, yourself uh, down there. Uh, the weather is incredible most of the time. Uh, this is a fabulous um, vacation and destination. The beaches are uh, among the best um, in the Mediterranean. Um, culture um, in general. These are people that are, um, you know, pretty pretty famous for knowing how to enjoy life. Uh, and the Tobanco, the it's what like like a wine bar, right? But nowhere else in the world will you find Tobancos except in Jerez, right? So yeah, Tobanco is 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 a Jerez word. Uh, really associated with with the region uh and is this these wine bars um i mean you can find them in paris too right and, and new york but uh tabancos are, are pretty special with with you know the barrels some of the wines are sold in in bulk 
and you just you know uh pour their ammo out of, out of the cask um and then always food and small portions you have all those all those tapa style serving and a lot of action a lot of um you know roar and and activity and and good vibe because these again are people that really know how to how to enjoy life um from you know from left to right uh architecture and that um related to uh, you know connected to uh, the the background the multicultural background we were talking about before right uh, this is a an area that has been um uh, occupied by many different many different people over the course of those three thousand years we were talking about uh, if you learn about uh, the Iberian Peninsula's uh, history, you'll see that a lot of different, um, you know, background people from different parts, whether this was like more the Northern European or, or even the Africa and and um, uh, Middle Eastern um, societies, they were all passing. This this is a, an important gateway to to either africa or, or europe so a lot of um different cultures were were here some of them residing staying for for centuries on end so we're talking about just not you know a couple of years but many of them were they established for for long periods and they all left their their footprint right they the ways they they build buildings, the way they uh, enjoy uh, gastronomy, um, grew vines, uh, made wine or spirit. The region has been um, um, known for producing some sort of uh, beverage, whether this is wine or some sort of drink or spirit for for forever, you know, ever since. So that, uh, along with the architecture is uh, something that is um, yes. really just worth visiting. Uh, some of the most like, uh, impressive of, buildings uh, in Southern Europe, for sure. It's also the home of flamenco, right? This is where flamenco started. And the music. Yes. That was going to be my next uh, topic oh, here. Okay. <laughs> music is uh, uh, very special. Uh, flamenco is uh, maybe not everyone's cup of tea, but something that when you experience it, and that's the thing, and Adrian was also saying this, when when you experience it like on the ground, life has nothing to do with what you can hear on, on Spotify, right? So a flamenco show, uh, it's a, a life-changing experience. Um, that with a glass of Jerez in your hand, um, late night is uh, something really, that is going to stick with you for for a long time so uh other other things like horses these are some of the most beautiful horses you can find in in the entire uh, european continent uh and only that um el, el caballo andaluz is uh, really you know uh, gorgeous uh, good looking but the way they 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 train them uh the things that they they're able to get out of these uh, horses are incredible. Um, you can uh, go the Andalusian uh, horses, right? Which I know they tour across the U.S. occasionally. So it's been a while. Yes, but you yes. can't see them even in the U.S. Yes. So yes, huge breeds with a very elegant poster and and uh, very very cool animals. And these guys they managed to make them do extraordinary things like like walking sideways and backwards and then up and down and they're actually dancing on the horses um so something something very cool also there is a race um on the beach uh, um every summer um with these horses and, and i mean uh, what a show that they, they put out is in, is incredible um what else um history i mean i guess we kind of touched on that before but yeah history you know the the uh, the way these uh, small towns look um it's like going back in in time 
and they, they pretty remain um, the same way. These are not really urban, sophisticated, um, you know, cities. These are like small uh, towns with, with um, you know, houses are looking the same way they were, um, you know, centuries ago. So um, a, a trip, a really true, a true trip to, to, to the roots, back to the roots, if you, if you will. And then as any other wine region, you, you, and Jerez is complicated enough that you, you, I'm sure you're gonna have a couple of questions for, for, for the winemaker when, when you visit. So when, when you walk into a bodega building, when you pick up that smell, when you, when you see the barrels, when type of, you know, uh, floor or, or, or ground is when you really start to get in a, a whole of, of things. And um, this is true for any, any wine region, but in particular, Jerez um, needs uh, kind of like being there and um, just being able to touch and talk and, um, you know, like soak in that, that culture to be able to understand, understand the wines. And then is when you get there and then you really see that Wow, um, the diversity of the styles is incredible, and that uh, some people think this is kind of overwhelming because so so many different jerezes you can you can try again from very ultra dry to the sweetest wine you can imagine, and um, all those things combined with the gastronomy and the different times of the day, and and you can just you know stay in Jerez for two or three weeks just enjoying these wines maybe a light beer in between uh hours but um it's it's a it's a full full-on experience for sure and uh it will it will it will pay back i'm sure thank you lucas yes we will um looking forward to um visiting with you in le Stel, um next year anytime, anytime. um so paul let's talk a little bit um about madeira so in these other places, in Porto, in Jerez, Lisbon, Madrid, etc., there's a lot to do. There's so much to see. It's so exciting, and um, the list can be terribly long. And that's why I think that if you're going to do an Iberian tour, in, with I, with Madeira being outside of Iberia, this is where you come to relax. Do this at the end where it's a much more, uh, uh, it's a pretty tranquil place. Um, you can just see from the landscape that uh, it's, a, it's an amazing spot. It's uh, quite beautiful. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Like all of these other places, wine tourism is a big part. There's a lot of tasting opportunities here. The, 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 the restaurant scene in, uh, in Funchal, uh, the main uh, city of the island has really come a long way as has everything in Portugal in that regard. Um, this is an island that is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with a lot of very, very deep cold water around it. So the abundance of amazing seafood that you can have when you come to this island is, is fantastic. It's really great. Um, and like Hawaii, they actually have a, a, a lot of beef production here. So um, there's actually uh, uh, the, the, the ispeta, with the, with the beef on it is um, a big deal. So um, it's not just for fish lovers. You can, you can be beyond pescatarian and come here <laughs> and enjoy yourself from a culinary standpoint. So wine and food, of course, plays a really big part here as well as in the other areas. Um, next uh, slide, please. I think one of the things that to me personally, uh, I enjoy most when I come to the island is the natural beauty that's here. Um, there is a series of a, a, a large number of granite built channels that carry water from the north side of the island to the south side of the island, and they're called levadas. And the, the, the Brits really did a great thing when they started hanging out here, is they started creating walking paths along these water channels. And they become a whole network of hikes that are very well demarcated and very well signed throughout the island. 
Um, and some are more difficult than others. Uh, some are just a very uh, nice, easy stroll. Um, others are a lot more challenging and, uh, and rewarding from what you get out of them. But uh, one of the things about going to visit the island is going to see this amazing natural beauty that's, uh, um, this one is in the interior. I've done a number of these Levada walks that are on the coastline as well. Uh, and they're pretty spectacular. So this is a great place uh, to come if you love nature and you want to spend some time chilling out. Next slide. So uh, that first slide was an interior shot. This is one that's linking two amazing, um, the, the most uh, uh, high hilltops within the island, the Pico Aireiru and um, Pico Rivu, um, that are uh, pretty dramatic. And at, in the morning, they're engulfed in mist. I mean, this and looks like, like, like out of Lord of the Rings. Or something. Lord of the Rings, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and as, 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 as dangerous and weird as it may look, the path is actually quite easy to do. It's not a, it's not a real big challenging um, path. And your Instagram lights off of this hike are just totally off the charts. There you go. So uh, I can't uh, recommend highly enough that element of, uh, of going to see the island. Next slide. So, you know, uh, Adrian was talking a lot about uh, the, the opportunities of, of wonderful places to stay in Porto. And they've done a magnificent job of renovating uh, uh, old places that, uh, that once had maybe, you know, kind of fallen from grace that he's, he and his group have, have brought back to life and just created amazing spots. Um, similar things have happened in Madeira. Uh, and actually throughout a lot of Portugal. Uh, Reed's Palace is a pretty famous legendary hotel that's uh, on, uh, in Puchal, uh, that's right on the sea, you see that here. There are a couple of other you know, fairly grand hotels, some modern ones uh, that are in the Funchal area, uh, you know, which is the main city, it's kind of where, where the action is, uh, and that's great. But there are also a lot of other uh, villages uh, on the south shore of the island and particularly on the north shore of the island that have a very different vibe. So if, if, if a more grand hotel experience is uh, to your liking, this is very much available to you, but there are also some amazing smaller experiences that you can enjoy as well. Next slide. So this is again, one of the smaller towns that's uh, on the coast in, in the south that I think is quite beautiful. This is, I. It's not sound descent. Uh, I can't be precise which one it is, but it kind of gives you an idea of, of, of the landscape. It's not a beach uh, opportunity to a great degree. The cliffs go straight down into the water. Um, there is an adjacent island called Porto Santo. There's a, there's a, a, a little hopper plane that you can take to get over there that has beautiful beaches that's available for that as well. Next slide. Uh, just a, a bit, again, uh, reminding you about the, uh, the wine lodge and the opportunity to taste old Madeiras and, uh, and, you know, purchase some things that you might not be able to get here in the United States. And we actually, we had reservations because you have apartments in the, in the wine lodge, right? They're amazing. We, They're we had reservations. Of... We had a couple apartments there that we were going to stay and um, sneak down at night and try some of the extra wines. <laughs> so. That's great. It's an amazing uh, uh, set up because it's there, it's right above the lodge, which is right downtown, right smack in the middle of Funchal on a beautiful civic garden. And I've stayed in them a couple of times myself, and I can't recommend them highly enough. There's you no know, fully serviced kitchen, everything that you need to self cater and, and make yourself at home. And it's uh, a very relaxed way to have uh, uh, a vacation. So I can't recommend that enough. Yeah. Well, thank you, Paul. Yeah. I think so there's good. one more slide. Oh, is there? Oh, hold on. There, there, sorry. Ah, yes, sorry. There we go. That's my favorite place, Ponte da Sol. So this is about 30 minutes outside of Funchal. And it's a little village on a cove. It's got a fantastic little boutique hotel. It's, again, it's a very, very short drive from the, from the main city and from the airport. And if you just want to get away and have a very, very quiet weekend, uh, and chill out. It's a great spot to go to. Excellent. It looks beautiful. Great coloring on this. So. so thank you very much. I hope you can all make it to the island and, and, and to the Iberian Peninsula and, and make this wonderful trek that you're talking about of going to see these three great regions of, of fortified wine. We will um, 
everybody get your vaccines and we will do that. So Monday, I get my second hit. Oh, very yeah, good. Tomorrow I get my first. Congrats. I just got mine. Yes. Two days ago, I got my second. So Don't, we I'll shouldn't be ready for a couple of weeks. We shouldn't gloat too much. It's harder in Europe. So it is. So, so. Um, so as, um, as we mentioned at the beginning that um, there is going to be a, um, a giveaway of a, uh, the new Corvin pivot. Um, so um, we're going to send some questions out. So go ahead and answer those. And again, whoever answers the most correct um, will be notified by email because we'll, we'll download all the answers and we'll, we'll look at them um, afterwards. But I'm going to go ahead and put that up on your screen now. Um, now, gentlemen, you're not eligible to win. Thank you. you probably don't need any more of them. So. <laughs> members, members of my. There we go. So here we go. Um, so you should see it up on your screen now. So go ahead. And um, uh, there are 12 questions. Just go ahead and go through them and answer them. Some are true and false. Some are multiple choice. So just go ahead and um, answer those out now. So. Can I travel with my Corvin system? I did not speak to that. Ooh. You gave me these questions. <laughs> oh, Katya gave me these questions. Sorry. <laughs> I feel I feel guilty. I don't want to. I don't want to give away the uh, the answer to that one. And also, it, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> I guess that's a hint. I'm not going to say anything because I could get arrested in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> because of the Corbin or because some other reason? <laughs> Always a fair question with me. Always a fair question. <laughs> so fun fact, and I'm not sure that it's on the list. Lucas was somewhere at El Boyi for a very long period of time. So, uh, do you have any elderly questions? That was a long time, long time ago. What do fried rabbit ears taste like? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. To <laughs> <So> Americans, horrible. <laughs> what would you pair with a fried rabbit ear? An Amontillado sherry. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I got to tell you, the nose on the Fino was stunning. It was uh, the it was, acidity yeah. of the of the... Madeira is really a striking point of Madeira. I mean, yep. it's unbelievable. And then Porto is like a, an incredible candy store of the wonders of, of a red grape. Porto does make up a fairly large section of my cellar. So um, Adrian, you, you do have a Big chunk of my money in, in your account. So yes. I always knew you were civilized, John. <laughs> so the the oldest bottle of wine that I knowingly have had is a Madeira, 1700s, mm -hmm. um, served by one of my investors. And the the uh, the oldest Porto was, of course, with Adrian in his home. And I think when he walked out, he had the bottle in his hand. And he said, "I think this was the end of your civil war." <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis on the word civil, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're sort of having that civil war still. Yeah. <laughs> in our country. So and Adrian, then, of course, I've had more meals with Lucas than anyone else. Adrian, you used uh, to sell one of the very old, something from the 1800s in the tasting room by the glass when it was very, very thick, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, that was that was we had the yeah the 1863 which we 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 tasted with you which was was aged in cask so obviously all that time concentrating down is what right. made it made it thicker. Um, with Greg, I tasted um, a an 1868 vintage port from Quinta de Vajalas uh, when he came to visit me in my house. So a um, uh, little different. You know, something in a bottle for all that time and needed to, you know, needed to be tasted. There was some it worm that had tried to eat its way into the bottle and it had gotten halfway through the cork oh. and given up <laughs> and turned around the other direction. And we were both very happy that that was the case. Yeah, very happy worm. Yeah, very happy worm. 
I remember you, I had a bottle of the wine that you had bottled for your son, I think when he maybe turned 21 and there was a terribly embarrassing picture of, of him on the, uh, yeah. on the label. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the advantages of, 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 of being the sort of current generation of a, of a business is that you can create labels for appropriate wines, you know, or when you have an appropriate occasion, it's fairly easy to get a special bottling, whichever way you want want to look at it. I, and for you, ago, I remember doing. Um, we were at um, a, 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 a friend of ours whose whose mother was uh, is it was um, lady in waiting to the Queen Elizabeth, and we were at a private luncheon with the Queen, and uh, we'd made an eight year old uh, tawny, um, and I had to stand up and sort of talk about it. And um, I was explaining the wine and I said, and I was sort of a bit pushed of what to say. So I said, of course, there's that tremendous story about, about port where you, you pass it to the left. And the reason, of course, this happens is that um, you then leave your right arm, your sword arm free to defend yourself. And Her Majesty picked up her knife and went, swish, 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 swish. And I said, yes, your majesty's got the idea. And then I felt, of course, immediately horribly embarrassed that I, how could I say that? <laughs> Just nonetheless, that was that, it had been said. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how involved the United Kingdom was in wine, given that until recently, it produced no wine. And it you know, traveled the world. It yeah. enjoyed wine and it traveled the world. Look at the story of Madeira. I mean, what is Madeira if it isn't a fantastic place to take, as, as Paul was saying, take on board water, wine, food, and, and you're at the beginning of all a lot of winds and currents that will take you to amazing exotic places of the world. I mean, how do you get to South, how do you get to Cape Town from Europe quickly? Go via Rio, Rio yeah. de Janeiro. Take the coast out, you know, take the winds over and the currents over and then swing down. Now we fly, but uh, the old days, you had to cross the Atlantic to do it. Plus, I guess oh, Britain and, and Portugal have the longest trade treaty, right, in, in existence. You know, they. Correct. Which was. Because they were always fighting with the French and the Spanish, so they wanted their own wine. So. It'll, it'll, it'll um, celebrate 650 years in, in 2023. So. Uh, news to come, things to happen, but, but you're absolutely right. But, but they're also right. You're also right, John, in the sense that so much of this is anchored in history. And um, so many of the great wine regions of the world um, have got strong historical contexts, which, which make them so, so fascinating. Sure. That's why when we do our tours, we make sure that, you know, we look at the history, we look at the culture, the food, because wine cannot just be drank by itself. There's something, you're drinking history, you know, even if you're drinking just a newer wine, you're drinking something that was just, you know, bottled five years ago, like, like Paul Yerbois. I mean, that you're drinking something from five years ago that can never be replicated exactly the way it was. You're drinking a piece of history from five years ago or, you know, whatever your vintage is, you know, when you open that 1868 bottle, you're drinking a, a piece of history that can never be replicated. It can be copied, but it will never be, you know, the exact same thing of drinking that piece of history, so. And it comes, John, from the, the traditions created over centuries, and that's the real point. Yeah, it's, it's also a, a history of travel. I mean, I think that uh, with both Port and, and Madeira, there were boats involved shipping things around mm -hmm. um and with with sherry you see this ancient culture and all of these different cultural influences that result in the style of wines and to be able to taste it's them all. Revolved around around politics and conflict right because in so many instances uh major wine producing countries were at conflict with britain and because they didn't have a wine producing culture themselves they had to buy it from somewhere. And if France was not going to be the supplier, it had to be somebody else. And there were some logical places that were nearby where the shipping routes were safe and, uh, and workable. And that, that was a huge amount of commerce. When we think about it, 
you know, for those of us that are that were around um, during the, uh, the 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 gas embargo um, in the United States, uh, it's not unlike what happened when Britain and France, you know, had this gigantic trade dispute um, that involved wine. Wine was the, was the, pe- the the oil of the world at the time. It was a huge commodity. And it represented an enormous amount of business. And when that came to a close, or you know, came to a, a big problem, and the, the 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 British, you know, had to find wine somewhere else, and Portugal was the lucky, you know, country to win out. Um, it changed the whole economic dynamic, and it was from a politi- It was the result of a political conflict, and we see this happening over and over again. As we get, but it's an amazing. Um, example, including today with uh, Champagne and and France and the twenty five percent tariffs and what China has done to Australia, yeah. um, and the wine imports from Australia to China it used to be enormous and they dropped by ninety five percent in one year right. because of the political conflict. Right, and obviously we all have friends in California who in Napa County, in Napa Valley in particular, who have had huge amount of business with China over the last you know 15 20 years that's completely come to a, a stop and it's a, it, it has a huge impact on uh, particular regions that have invested very very much in in in, in markets so, so let me say we're going to give one more minute here for everybody to finish up with the questions and then we're going to um, let Adrian go to bed and um, everybody else will go to dinner <laughs> So we'll, we'll wrap our arms around Spain and Portugal as, as we all should. Um, Lucas and I were in Madrid and we were in a, a really incredible restaurant that we were walked to by a good friend of ours who runs one of the best wine stores, La Vina, in, in Madrid. Mm. And, uh, and he wanted to bring us there because he said, you know, they're using Corvin in a way that you wouldn't anticipate. And I think it was a flamenco, flamenco dancing uh, performance, and they had one of the largest collections of sherry, um, in, I guess, in Spain. And the way that they were doing it was they were drilling through the tea top plastic, and then corroding through the 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 middle when they got rid of the, the plastic and going through the cork. And they were so proud of it. I've got a video online, and I'll post it again. Um, the drill. Yeah, the drill, exactly. And th- this is what made me think I've got to invent. I was like, I can use the pivot. <laughs> right, exactly. I was like, I've got to save these guys their drill bits. <laughs> it, it, it's not Australia, but it, it's getting close to it. Oh, my God. It was such a spectacular experience. And it was one of the last trips that I took or that we took before the pandemic. They, they have their own their own techniques there. Um, but, uh, you know, not too savvy, but... No, it was, I, think, I thought it was, it was the most creative thing that I'd seen in a long time. And I went back and actually designed drill bits that people would use. But then I was like, oh, wait a minute, we can do this pivot thing and, um, and get to the T-top. These wines are so spectacular. I think if the people that have, have been with us for, for tonight, you recognize the incredible difference between Sherry and Madeira and Port. Um, also, the incredible locations that each of them are made. Uh, I'm always told that people, by, by people in the wine industry, wine is made by great people in wonderful, beautiful places. And I think that's very true, in particular, of Sherry, Madeira, and Court. Um, and, you know, having, I, I've, not, I've not had dinner yet with Paul, and I, I need to. Uh, and I hope that we have dinner together in Madeira. That would be spectacular. That's great. Uh, seeing the pictures made me want to travel immediately and tasting the wine, of let's course. All, let's make an appointment. We're, we're going to meet you there, Paul. So um, The second choice is San Francisco, and that doesn't suck. So you can, San Francisco is pretty good, too. too I, so, yeah. I go out there to raise money and meet with the guys in Napa. So, totally okay. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the questions. So thank you, everybody, who um, uh, filled out the questions. Um, we'll be in touch with you in the next day or so. So I'm ending that. There we go. And um, so I want to thank uh, Greg. Thank you for helping uh, put this together. Uh, it couldn't have happened without you. Um, and Paul, Lucas, and Adrian, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your wine, some beautiful pictures. Um, we all are just dying to travel again. And I know um, all three locations are going to be on our list to get to in the next year. Um, so everybody um, just um, 
get your vaccinations because that's going <laughs> to allow us all to keep traveling. Um, so um, thank you again so much. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for staying up so late. I know it's very, very early for you. Um, I appreciate everything. Um, but we will come and see all of you very soon. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in week after week. Join us next week. We're going back to Virginia for early mountain wines. Um, and then the week after that, we'll be in South Africa for Ken and Cop. We're going to do um, various Pinotage, a rosé um, in the state, and then their Black Label Reserve. Um, so we're going to do Pinotage um, the way it should be done. So thank you again, everybody. You have a great night. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye. Really a pleasure.